Grief is Real, Big, Better Shared, the podcast everyone needs to hear, but nobody wants to hear. I'm Kevin Lee, President and CEO of MidAmerica Transplant, and we are honored to sponsor this episode of Grief is Real, Big, Better Shared. At MidAmerica Transplant, we have the privilege of working with families across Southern Missouri and Northeast Arkansas who make the heroic decision to donate their loved one's organs or tissues. While donation often brings families comfort, they are still heartbroken by their loss. We are driven by compassion for these families and continue to walk with them through their grief journey. MidAmerica Transplant provides several programs to help families memorialize their loved one, but we believe that some of the best support can be provided by a grief center. We are proud to work with the Center for Good Grief and appreciate everything they are doing in the region to bring healing to people who are coping with loss. MidAmerica Transplant is inspired by life and by the donor families who give transplant patients a second chance at life. For more information about being a donor, visit SayYesGiveLife.org. Hello, welcome to Grief is Real, Big, Better Shared, the podcast everyone needs to hear, but nobody wants to hear. I'm Angela Hamblin Kelly, the administrator of the Baptist Centers for Good Grief, and we're so glad that you are tuning in today. If this is your first time checking out our podcast, please know that we have season one available wherever you get your podcast. In season one, there's a lot of great content about grief in general, about spouse loss, men in grief, and important things to know about childhood and adolescent grief. So make sure you go back and catch up on those episodes. With season two, we've heard from you and we listen to you, and we're going to focus more on some specific topics in a very short format. Just as a reminder, the Baptist Centers for Good Grief has been providing grief care for over 25 years. We've grown from a children's grief camp to a program with three comprehensive grief centers in Tennessee and Arkansas. We started this podcast because grief is the most universal experience there is. Again, this is the podcast everyone needs to hear because grief involves pain and vulnerability, which is also why this is the podcast nobody wants to hear. So I sit here today as a grief counselor, but I'm also a griever. So in our podcast, we hope to honestly look at grief and discuss the heart and head tug of war from an evidence-based grief counseling perspective, but also the very real life perspective as well. So today's episode, we are going to talk about a topic that is very important to us at the Baptist Centers for Good Grief, and that is how to tell a child that someone they love has died. Let me start by saying that I wish no child ever had to grieve, ever, ever, ever. However, we know that is not the world that we live in, and this podcast is one that means so much to us. Like I said, we we get so many calls from parents or other family members in high stress situations because maybe they're on their way to pick up their child from school and they need to tell them that somebody in their family has died. The panic, the fear, how do I do this? Exactly what do I say? And oh my goodness, will they be okay? Those are the things that we hear so often. So in this episode, we're gonna talk step by step about these hard conversations. And to do that today, Lauren, our clinical director at the Baptist Centers for Good Grief, is joining me. Thank you so much, Lauren, for being here. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, Lauren, I know when I came to you about this podcast, um, you were the natural uh, one for me to come to because you and I have actually had these conversations so many times together with so many different families. And first, I just have to thank you for your willingness to to have those hard conversations, because it's hard. It's hard to talk to people about things that you know are going to hurt them so much. But I think we know on the flip side, having these hard conversations, there are so many benefits down the road with a relationship with a child and parenting. And um, so again, thank you for all the many conversations you have had with me over the years with families. So let's, let's talk about, um, let's start with maybe the important pieces of this type of conversation. Um, You know, people often ask us, um, you know, kind of what's the recipe to grief? They want the steps and 
we don't have the steps. There are no steps. We're there, you know, we're telling people that all the time. This is probably about the only thing that we do that we will actually give people steps to. Um, so if you're out there listening and you want to write some steps down, grab your pad and your pen and we'll give you some steps because with this type of conversation, we do want to make sure we do some things kind of in a specific order. Um, so we're going to talk about, we're going to kind of tell you what each step is. And then we're going to go into uh, specific detail about each step. So um, first, um, I think the first step here is where to have this conversation. Yeah. You want to make sure that you have these kind of conversations in a place that is familiar for the child um, and that's someplace that feels safe for them as much as possible. And we recognize that sometimes there's limitations to this, but this is something we encourage you to just keep in mind that you want to be in a familiar, safe place, you know, such as at their home. Okay. So that's that first step is where we're doing this. And then second is the language, you know, um, how to tell your child, I need to talk to you about something very sad that's happened today. And that's very direct, um, you know, very in to the, to the point with some specific language, um, we'll get into the details here in a minute, uh, kind of about a formula of how to do that with just a couple of sentences and then being really mindful to stop talking and let them absorb it um, and let that sink in. And so um, we, we think that's that second piece. So Lauren, what's the next step there? Just knowing that it's okay to show emotion. It's okay to cry. Um, and it's okay not to have all of the answers right now. And even though you may not have all the answers, you may want to ask them if they have any questions. Um, so as Angela said, you say a couple of sentences, you, you give them a chance for that to sink in, and you also give them an opportunity to ask questions. So now let's get into the detail. And Lauren, you, you started us off with talking about the where to have the conversation, but let's talk a little bit more detail about that, um, about the where. A lot of times, um, I think when the phone calls come in, they want to know exactly what to say. And, you know, just like we just sort of rolled out this formula, I'll say, well, first we need to start with the where. And they're like, oh, that wasn't even on my mind, you know, or I thought we would do it here. Where do we see that these conversations um, start the best in terms of location? Ideally, you know, at their house um, yeah. and not in, you know, the, the, an uncomfortable room that they don't normally go in, you know, someplace that feels very comfortable for them. Um, but if you're not able to have it at their home, again, just you want to try to make it as comfortable a place as possible. Um, and, and a place that feels as familiar as possible. Um, and you want the person who tells them to be somebody who they are comfortable and familiar with. Yes. And I would encourage, you know, the person who's telling them, you know, maybe if it's a parent who died and the other parent is who's telling them, as that other parent, you know, think about maybe one other person that you would like to be present in that room with you. Um, maybe as they don't have a speaking role. Um, they're there just sort of as an anchor, a physical anchor for for you as the adult and just another adult that can be present in that room with them as well. So I think the more familiar the space and definitely, um, you know, more familiar of the people. Sometimes we know, though, it doesn't happen that way. You may be in a hospital and you may have to go, um, you may have to step into another room, you know. That's where I would say, you know, the hall, busy hallway wouldn't be the most ideal. Is there somewhere else within a hospital that you can go and sit down and talk? Um, and, and sometimes things just happen and we, you know, you do the best you can. Um, but if you have the ability being in that comfortable space, I've even talked with families before about, um, maybe don't take them to a room in the house that's a formal room that you never use, you know, go into a comfortable space, a f space that feels um, that is a normal part of your family routine, if you can. Yeah. So the next we talked about, you know, how to actually tell them um, with direct language and, um, and, and how to do that. And that may be saying, you know, I want to talk to you about something very sad that happened today. So, I mean, that's a sentence you can write down if, if you're about to have this conversation is that is a way that you can start. I want to talk to you about something very sad that happened today. 
And then the next sentence, and, and I'm a big believer in kind of using three sentences, um, three short to the point sentences. So then the next sentence is, Grand, granddaddy died, you know, or whoever you need to tell them that has died, that's the next sentence. So the first sentence is, I want to talk to you about something very sad that happened today. And then the next sentence is, they died. And we have to say died. We find that that's better for kids to understand than other words because I don't maybe understand really what that word means. And that, that finality of hearing that word, they died. And then kind of pause, let them absorb it. Remember that you as the adult have had a little time to process this. I mean, even if it's just been a little, but, but you've known this information. They're just now getting it for the first time. So give their, their brains a minute to take that in. And I'll t I talk a lot to adults about just stop and watch them. Watch them take that breath. They'll oftentimes look at you. And then you can say, um, depending on the child, sometimes I'll say, um, can, you, can you tell me what you heard? Sometimes I've done that with some kids just to make sure they really heard that. Or sometimes they'll look at you and they'll say, what happened? And that's really important in that moment, as hard as it is, to, to let that child know what happened. And that can be really hard for a lot of adults to talk about causes of death. I think, Lauren, you can tell me here, but I think people can typically say, you know, they had cancer or there was a car accident. But things that are harder for adults to process, more of these maybe sudden and traumatic types of death, um, homicide, suicide, overdoses, things like that that are so complicated for us as adults to understand, to grapple with the emotions that come with that from either anger to guilt to just confusion. It is helpful to tell a child what we can age appropriately because their little minds will take it and they will try to find an answer. They oftentimes, so many children have um, access at their fingertips to social media or to Google, and they can find out what happened. Oftentimes children have older siblings, older cousins, or they hear family talking, and this is a critical moment for adults and children to build trust. So I want to talk to you today about something very sad that happened your daddy died. He was in a car accident. Stop talking. Let, let it sink in. And as we mentioned before, after, you know, giving them a minute, you know, kids are going to respond differently. And they don't always respond as we expect them to. They may not always burst into tears right then. They may look at you and say, well, can I go play now? Yes. And that doesn't mean that they don't care. Children in many ways are, they're better grievers yes. than adults are. Yes. Because they naturally can do the back and forth of, you know, kind of leaning into their grief and then stepping away from it that adults really struggle with. We have to be a lot more intentional about it. And children you know, just do that so naturally. And when it's reached the point where they've kind of, that's all they can process, then they're kind of done. And they may be ready to go play. And that doesn't mean that they don't care. That means that that's just what they're needing in that moment and that that's absolutely okay. Um, or sometimes they may come back with more questions or sometimes they might just look at you kind of blankly and, and very confused. And you don't have to keep going, you know, it, don't feel like you have to try to explain, explain, explain. Right. You know, the goal is not to overwhelm them with information, but you may want to ask them, um, do you understand what that means? Mm -hmm. um, or you may want to ask them if they have any questions, as, as I mentioned before. Um, 
just to give them that space, first of all, so that you know that they understood, and second of all, so that they know that it's okay for them to talk about it. It's okay for them to have questions and that you want them to come to you with those questions so that you can give them that direct age-appropriate information. And, um, you know, when we use that word age-appropriate, sometimes I think that may feel a little vague for people. Yes. Um, and I think a lot of times people's, you know, gut reaction is, you know, I, I don't want to, to tell them something that is too complex or, or difficult for, for them to hear at this age. Mm -hmm. And what, what you just want to keep in mind is that you want the information that you give them to be honest. You want it to be enough information for them to have an understanding about what happened because you don't want them to try to connect dots in ways that, um, that, you know, that you would never even imagine because sometimes that can be harder for them to process than the truth. You don't have to tell them every detail of what has happened. Um, you know, you, you don't have to, sh to share every single thing. So you want it to be direct and age appropriate, but you also want it to be just sort of the, the most simple way that you can tell them that they can have all of the pieces that they need to begin to process it at this time. And um, they may come back with questions either right away or they might go play for a little while and then come exactly. back with questions. And if they ask you a question that kind of stumps you, don't feel like you have to have the answer right away. It's okay to say, that's a really good question, and I have that question too. Or it might be okay to say, you know, that's a really good question. Let me think about that, mm -hmm. and I'm going to come back to you, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, the important thing about that is be sure you come back to it. Yes. I think that, you know, it, it's so easy to say, okay, well, maybe they'll just forget that they asked, mm -hmm. you know, um, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And you want for them to know that they can trust, you know, Angela, mm -hmm. you know, that niche and trust and the importance of that, that they can trust that you will come back with an answer and that you will answer their questions and that they can um say out loud what they're thinking or what they're wondering about um, and that you are a safe person that they can they can do that with. Absolutely, because when you're saying, I want to talk to you about something very sad today, daddy died, he was in a car accident, there's other conversations that need to be had with that. But we are just simply trying to get this first information out because we've worked with so many children that Maybe they uh, were sat down and were told what happened, and they walked away not understanding that the person died. And so for this episode, we're simply talking about just being very direct and getting this message out, and then the conversations continue. The conversations of grief continue and mourning and, and helping your child understand, and maybe your child you know, like you said, Lauren, wants to go play and kind of have that natural release, and then they come back and say, well... Where where was daddy? Where was he driving? Was somebody else? Did he hit another car? Did somebody hit him? You know, then the specifics may come in. And um, um, I think we have to remember, and you just did that so well of saying, we've got to come back to the conversations. But when we're initially telling, we want to be very short, you know, direct, to the point, use very specific language, stop and be quiet and then see where they go. And I also love what you said, Lauren, about when they do ask questions, please, please know you don't have to have all the answers. And it is okay to tell them that um, and or to say that's really great. I'm going to write that down because I need to think about that or I need to, we need to find some people that we can ask these questions to. So when telling a child that someone they love died, we've, we've talked about this kind of formula of the where and the and the how and the direct language and being quiet. Um, and we mentioned this at the very beginning of the podcast, but a lot of times um, adults really struggle with the more sudden and traumatic types of deaths. And, and we have podcasts on these topics and we certainly plan on having more um, into next year, but homicide, suicide, and let's say accidental overdose, for example, require some different language. You know, we need to, let the child know that their loved one has died. And then just like you might say, your daddy was in a car accident or, you know, grandma had cancer. 
you know, figuring out how do we say this when we ourselves have so much emotion attached, or maybe we don't know the answers yet. And sometimes we have to say to a child that, that we don't have all the answers as to how daddy died, but as I get them and as I find out more information, we're going to let you know. Or we say, we know that your daddy was shot you know, using that language. Oftentimes, if we say that, the child quickly will want to know, well, who did it? Or are we safe? And then that leads to a discussion of they know who did it, that person's in jail, or they don't know who did it. And here are the things that we're working on to be safe. So a lot of times this conversation can lead to so many others. And that's why we're being very intentional about having kind of this scripted a little bit to give them the information, to make sure they understand And then knowing that maybe you, as the listener of this podcast, is going to need to talk with a grief counselor to work out, you know, more of the specifics of these continued conversations. I think that with, uh, we see this a lot with all three of these, with homicide, suicide, and drug overdose, that um, it is important when talking with children about this to separate a person from the action. So, for example, with suicide, it is important for them to know that their loved one did something to end their life on purpose. And it is also okay to let them know that that there was a sickness in their brain that made it where it was harder for them to act in the ways that they normally would and that they weren't able to think like they normally would and when they made that decision. And so what you're emphasizing is they they did something that ended their life. That doesn't mean that they were a bad person. It doesn't mean that they did not love you. You're, you're looking at the action, not the person. Same with drug overdose. That's um, one that's hard for um, people to wrap their minds around sometimes. You know, the topic of addiction in general can, can be very complex. And I think it's just always important, especially when talking with children, to really separate the actions that a person has taken from who they were as a person. Because in their world, that was somebody they they love very much. Absolutely. That is so, so, so critically important um, to separate the action from the person. And um, again, that's why it takes some time to kind of put together, you know, what do I want to say? And that's why you can imagine we get phone calls when parents are driving to schools to pick up children because they know we've got to have this. And I don't even know because I can't even begin to understand how I'm going to cope with this drug overdose um, or 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 whatever the death uh, is. But we know it's so, so critical that children be given accurate information, again, age appropriate. And that looks very different from a four-year-old to a 14-year-old. And, you know, that's why we're not sitting down here, you know, kind of telling you each age. But if you certainly work with your grief counselor, we would help you with that. And knowing, especially if you have, you know, a six-year-old and a 10-year-old, you're going to tell them the same thing, but you're going to give them, the 10-year-old, probably a little bit more information because they're going to probably ask very different types of questions. So, um Let's talk about some things to remember um, that when we're doing this, uh, because again, you as the parent or um, guardian or you know trusted adult in this situation, you're grieving too, and you need to remember that. Please remember, you're grieving too. You may not be at your best. Your mind is all over the place. Your feelings are all over the place. But you love this child, and you're 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 trying to intentionally do what is best for them and help them as they begin to navigate their grief, which none of us want to give that to a child. And so, you know, as Angela said, you've got your own feelings. It's okay to have those. So often I think adults feel like they have to be quote unquote strong for children. And by that, they mean they have to be stoic and and they don't show them any emotion. Um, But it's okay to show them your emotions. It's okay to cry in front of them. You are modeling for children how to grieve. And if they see in you that it's okay to have these feelings and to show them, then then they will know that too. If they see you holding it in, then that's what they think that they have to do as well. Um, if 
If it's maybe a moment where where you're feeling a lot of intense emotion, um, you, you may want to you know step away for that for that. Um, but just know that when you're having these conversations with children, it's okay for you to feel your grief as well and to acknowledge it. And I think what I often encourage is offer some reassurance with it. Yes. You know, you're, you're, you're validating their feelings by saying, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really sad right now. Yes. I, I, I know you are too. And it's okay for us to feel sad. And I, we're going to be okay. We're going to be able to take care of this. But right now we just need to feel sad. Or right now we may need to cry for a little bit. And that's okay. Yeah, that, that reassurance piece is so important. I think at the end of this conversation with a child is um, the reassurance. We may not have everything now. We may not know everything now, um, but we have each other, and you are loved. Um, I think that's so important. I, I think, too, sometimes children, um, especially if if maybe somebody in the family has died before or maybe they've seen it on TV, but sometimes kids will look up and say, are we having a funeral? You know, or... Um, are we going to bury dad or, you know, what's going to happen? And so I, I think it's very important when it comes to uh, planning services, whatever that may look like for your family, is um, continuing the conversation with the child, letting them understand what the service is. Um, if it's going to be a burial with a body, helping, let preparing them that the body will be there. If there's going to be a casket, if it's going to be open, um, if cremation, um, you know, explaining that to the child, letting them know. I've had a lot of kids walk in expecting to see a body and then very upset that they didn't get to see that. So just talking again, coming back and saying, let's talk about what we're going to do to remember daddy. We're going to have a memorial service or this, um, and letting them know. It's also just so important to give children choices when and where you can. So um, if you are planning a service, you know, including the child or asking them if there's anything that's important to them, um, if there's a song that's important, or um, I know sometimes children will put an item in the casket or they'll do a letter in the casket. Um, you know, if there's a casket, things like that, just allowing children opportunities to participate in ritual um, as they can. A lot of times, um, if you are preparing a child to see a body, um, don't be surprised if the child walks in and then looks at you and maybe becomes upset and says, but they're dead. You know, again, they're they're coping and their ability to process information is different. And we're going to see daddy and that's great. We're going to go see daddy. Maybe that child has never had this experience before. They don't know what dead is. And so helping them understand if that's what they're going to do, that daddy's going to be in a casket, maybe even showing them a picture and it's going to look like he's sleeping, but he's not sleeping. His body has stopped working. So this is what we were talking about earlier of continuing the conversations. I think it's important to keep in mind that grief does not follow a timeline for anyone. And that includes children. And and so with that, you know, I think sometimes adults with very good intentions will will want to really try to encourage a child to talk about what they're feeling or to say things out loud. Um, and the child may or may not be ready for that. And it's really important. This goes back to what Angela said about giving children choice. You know, it's really important to let them show their grief on their terms as much as possible that your goal is not necessarily to draw that out of them, but to create a safe space for them to do so when they're ready. Yes. Yes. You just want to be very calm. You want to try to answer their questions as best you can, but acknowledge if you don't have the answer, that's okay too. And, and really just try to be a good listener. I think so often um, we sort of discount the power in just listening to somebody and not trying not trying to jump in with the magic fix or the answer or something to cheer them up. That's not what they need. They just need that safe space. And a lot of times we'll hear parents and guardians and, and trusted adults say that they feel very helpless, you know, that the child has come to them and you know, is, is upset or is having a hard moment and they just don't know what to say. And, and we want you to know that it's okay not to have something to say. There may not be words in that moment, and that's absolutely okay. And I think in those moments, you can simply just say, I'm so glad you told me. 
I wish I could make it better. I love you. You know, I think we forget there's so much power and importance in those types of sentences. You know, yeah. a child being reminded that they're loved. Yes, absolutely. And and that their feelings are valid. Yes. You know, just even reflecting back to them what you're seeing. You are so sad right now. Yes. You miss your daddy. Yes. You wish that you could see him again. You know, just that help that helps them to know that they've been heard, mm-hmm. that they've been understood. Yeah. Um, and we have to remember that children are going to come back more than we want <laughs> and ask us these questions, or we're going to have to tell the explanation of the death. And so I think that's important for our, our listeners who are preparing for these conversations to know that kids have to hear this more than once, you know, um, because, you know, where they are developmentally and uh, just not understanding the permanence of death and those kind of things. And so they may need to hear the story more than once. Therefore, they need the reassurance more than once. And that's hard on us as adults. Yes. And for young children, they may need to hear what it means when somebody dies. Yes. You know, so what Angela said, that their body stops working, that they will not wake up. Um, that permanency is very hard for young children, you know, for three, four, five-year-olds to wrap their mind around. Um, so they may ask you over and over again, well, when when's grandma coming back? And you may have to say the same thing over and over. And so again, that's where we really like to um, emphasize, you know, having a couple of sentences that you can hold on to and that you can just say repeatedly, that you don't have to give more explanation. You may just have to give the explanation more than once. Well, a family that we worked with recently of, you know, that that a person hurt her. A person made a choice and hurt her and her body stopped working and helping young children. That was that was the language used for homicide for to help these young children understand. And they would come back and say, so so he somebody hurt her. They hurt her and her body stopped working. And these kids would ask their family this probably five times a day. And that's just so hard. I think we just can't stress that enough. But it was them processing it and taking it in and understanding it and also helping so much with their own fear of that it's not likely just something that's going to happen to me, you know, or, you know, giving uh, context to a situation which allowed for them to feel safe um, in a world that was all of a sudden very unsafe. I mentioned this earlier, but... You may see children shift quickly from, you know, wanting to express their grief to r- being ready to play or to, you know, not want to talk about it anymore. And that can be pretty abrupt. And that can truly feel very jarring for adults because they may have a child come to them and, and you know, perhaps they're crying or, you know, they're asking a lot of hard questions and, okay, they don't, you know, okay, let me sit down. Let's have this conversation. And then, you know, a few minutes later, the child's like, okay, I'm ready to go play. Right. And The adult is left going, what just happened? Because, you know, we don't shift gears so quickly. But children do. It's it's one of their strengths. Um, It's a positive thing. And it's okay to allow that and just sort of follow their lead with that, Um, that they will let you know. When, when they're needing to go there. And, and you'll see a lot of times it, it really naturally happens, you know, on their timeline. And sign other people up to help you your support system, your family, who who are trusted um, adults for this child and encourage them to, you know, continue to provide support, to be there for that child, to listen, you know, share with these people the language that you're using, share with them um, how you all as a family are talking about this so that they can continue to support the child too and that it's a consistent message. And sometimes you may have to do that with um, family members, you know, maybe that, aren't on the same page, for example, and you may have to say, this is the language we're using, and this is how we are talking about this in our home. So I would very much like you all to help support the children. You're important to them, but this is how we're doing this. This is how we're talking about it. Um, And that can be hard for different family members because of their own grief or whatever. But I think also we have to remember that older children, um, you know, maybe 
they might be seeking more of their support from their peers and just remembering that um, that children and teenagers have support systems as well and we need to encourage them um, and give them the space to have that and and you talked about earlier with younger children just wanting to play you know just that is that is a natural release for them and to to allow that space for them we, we want to allow children their time and space to play uh, especially at first you know there's all this busyness that's going on, but they just really need that space to play. That's such a natural need for children. And it's one of their primary forms of expression. Yes. Children, especially young children, they don't really have the verbal ability to talk about how they're feeling. And that just where they are developmentally, that may be hard for them to do. But they still have that same need for expression that adults do. And that's going to come out through play or through art or music or physical activity. But you're, you're going to see it come out in, in some of those ways. And so, first of all, just allow space for that, allow opportunities for that. Um, and also, don't be alarmed if you see themes of death or of their loved one's death coming out in their play. Uh, that's very natural and normal. That's their way of processing this. That's where, their way of expressing it. And um, if you need to, you can set some limits with that as far as, you know, the way that they play it out. For example, if there are violent themes or, or, or such, as that, such as that with, um, you know, you can set limits with how they play that out, especially with other children. That's absolutely okay. But just the play in and of itself, you, you do want to allow that. You don't want to try to put a stop to that because that is their form of processing. You just reminded me of a child I worked with a long time ago. Mom called one day because he was out on the trampoline and she could tell that he was just working himself up on the trampoline. And she went out there and you know, she's like, what's going on? And he was just physically, and he's like, I'm just trying to jump the highest I've ever jumped. And she was like, okay. And, she, and then he said, as she's walking around, like as she's turning back to go into the house, like, okay. He's like, cause I'm going to heaven. And so that was very startling to her. And um, he said, I'm trying to die so I can go to heaven. And again, kids' language is different. He wasn't intentionally trying to end his life, but he's out on the trampoline. The big sky is above him, and there were clouds out there. And if he could just get to one, he could see his dad for a little bit. So again, that's where, um, because of their, where they are developmentally, uh, these conversations have to continue. And, and that was all through his play that came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We certainly wish no child ever had to cope with death. Um, but we know that they can cope. So let me say that again. Children can cope. They can cope so much better with what they know and understand than with what they don't know. When they don't know, their brains take them on a little adventure. And as Lauren mentioned earlier, can sometimes come up with some really wild explanations. So let me say again, children can cope with death and grief. When they are surrounded with trusted adults who can share information with them and allow space for processing and talking and play. And so that's the whole purpose of this conversation today. And to know that you also don't have to do it alone. There are many, many people out there who can help you um, as you navigate uh, this conversation with the children in your lives. Lauren, do you have any final thoughts today? I just know that this topic and imagining having having these kind of conversations can feel very scary. And I think a lot of times the the, the biggest fear that we hear from people is, will I say something wrong? Yeah. Will I, will I um, cause things to be more difficult for them? And I think if you just keep in mind what Angela just shared, you know, that, that the goal is to just be a caring person and to create that safe space for them to know what has happened to know to begin to explore their grief on their time and in their way then that is what they need and and you will have done well so Lauren as we wrap up at the beginning I was talking about how many times you and I've had this conversation with people um, now let's let's tell the people listening you know what we hear after the conversations are had I mean I'm sitting here thinking about, Adults coming back and saying, I can't believe how well it went. Um, I'm so proud that I could do it. They heard it. You know, it didn't ruin them. Um, they're asking a million questions or we're continuing to have the conversation. But 
I think because you and I have done this so much, I think it's important to sort of end with telling people that we have seen the resilience in families, we've seen the resilience in children, and we've seen the trust between these relationships grow. Absolutely. I would say the most significant reaction that we hear after a conversation like this is relief because there, there is so much anxiety, understandably so, leading up to it. But afterwards, having it done and knowing that, okay, now I have, now we as a, as a family or as a supportive unit um, have laid a foundation for that child to begin that journey of coping with their grief. And honesty is going to be one of the most important steps of helping that child cope. Um, when, you, when you put the honesty out there, trust comes with it. And you want that trust to grow as the years uh, continue on. So thank you so much, Lauren, for uh, being here today with me and, and helping us you know, talk to families about these hard conversations. Absolutely. Thank you. Grief does heal. Let me say that again. Grief does heal. But like we've said, grief demands attention and care. It also needs support and patience. Remember that your grief is a reflection of your love. You are not alone. The world is full of many grievers like you. You can learn more about us at www.baptistgriefcenters.org. You can check out our YouTube channel, Baptist Centers for Good Grief. You can check out our podcast wherever you get your podcast. Also, know that you can reach out and let us know if there's a topic that you're interested in learning more about. You're welcome to email me at angela.kelly at bmhcc.org. That's A-N-G-E-L-A dot K-E-L-L-Y at bmhcc.org. And remember, grief is real, big, better shared. We'll talk soon.